Paul of Lewis already. He has uh, given several presentations already to the Watershed Education Center going way back to the first year when it uh, got started. <clears throat> He's a research scientist with the DEC. And I see, Lewis, the uh, department you work for now is the Finger Lakes Watershed Program. Is that the old watershed hub? Yes, it's exactly the same thing. Okay. Uh, so um, he is, one of the, his assignments is to uh, be a go-to person for Canisius Lake. If we have a question related to water quality. He is our first contact and he can point us in the direction of where to head. Uh, he spends a lot of time here. Uh, he uh, participates in the Watershed Council Technical Committee. And I'm looking forward to his talk tonight. Uh, I've heard, uh, like all of us have, we've heard a lot about space and what it might do for helping our lakes. And I'm particularly interested if it has going to have the capability someday to spot my golf ball when it, on a rare occasion when it gets hit, hit into the rough. Because mm -hmm. now that would be a real game changer right there. Just think of the economy of saving all those golf balls. But with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Lewis. All right, thanks very much, Gene and uh, Charlie. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, we're good to go, Lewis. Perfect, all right, thanks very much. And Gene, I may have a, uh, an answer about whether we can spot your golf ball from space. And the answer is unfortunately bad news. Okay. So um, uh, this, given that this is the Canisius Lake Watershed Education Series, I have tried to uh, include quite a lot of Canisius, but um, I've given parts of this talk to, to other lakes and to the, for instance, the um, North East Aquatic Biologists Conference, and so there are other lakes involved. And I hope to talk to, uh, not more than about 45 minutes. And so we've got uh, room for five or 10 minutes of questions if needed. So let's get going. So um, why are we interested in viewing lakes from space? Well, apart from how beautiful they can be, um, you can see this is actually not this is a picture not taken from a satellite. It's taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station. And the view is really unusual. Uh, we've got Lake Ontario here, Thousand Islands, and we've got uh, Oneida Lake and the Finger Lakes arrayed around here. Here's obviously Cayuca Lake, Canandaigua, and, and your beautiful lake is somewhere over here, I think, uh, going off into the distance with Lake Erie in the background. And you can see that there are all sorts of colors in this lake uh, from dark blue to almost white and these colors tell us something about the processes that are going on in the lakes. Now you'll all be familiar with harmful algae blooms they're being reported more often in New York and we think that uh, monitoring of lakes from space for algae blooms has got some potential. Now there are some ocean sensing satellites that have been launched, which are able to survey large areas on a daily basis. But the ponds and lakes that we're interested in are not really well served by those satellites. And I'll go into the reasons why. We're also interested in some of the lakes that are not eutrophic. That means the ones that are not heavily enriched in nutrients, ones that are more middling and, and low nutrient lakes. They're less studied and um, the satellites are able to give us some insights into those. So here are some early attempts at looking at your uh, at lakes from, from at least the sky. Um, the earliest pioneers went up in balloons with, uh, believe it or not, these glass plates and they had to process their glass plates while they were in the balloon which gave rise to the, um, the cartoon on the left. Later attempts were better and more successful. You can see in the middle there, um, this was not from somebody in a balloon, but from a captive balloon. This was Boston in the late uh, 1800s. And it was even tried to put cameras strapped to the chests of pigeons. And these were actually quite useful. You could train the pigeons to circle around a particular area 
and uh, there were homing pigeons. You could retrieve the photographic plate afterwards, and I guess you could uh, either stuff your pigeon as a memento or even put it in a pie and eat it later, um, or, or just pet it as well. That's also an alternative. Um, so things have moved on from those early attempts, and we now use really sophisticated uh, cameras in the sky to image the Earth on a daily basis, and our lakes can be imaged um, every three to five days or so. And I'm going to talk to you um, today about how we make that practically work. Right at the end, I know that you're all probably going to be interested in trying to see your own lake from space. And so we uh, will go through a little tutorial about how to do that. So how do we go, for example, from starting with a raw satellite image like this one of uh, Canandaigua Lake? DEC's interested, interest is not just to see the lake, we want to get some useful management information out of it. For instance, can we find out where a bloom is? Um, can we tell how much of a lake surface is covered in a harmful algae bloom? Um, are, there any, are there any beaches impacted? And are any water supply intakes disrupted? So we want to process that image to come up with something like this. Um, and this is Canandaigua Lake on the same day. Um, we've processed it to come up with an, uh, an estimate of chlorophyll concentration, which of course is present in, in uh, uh, green algae and to a certain extent in cyanobacteria. And we've got some concentrations that seem to be elevated in the northern part of the lake, less so in the south. We've also got some interference there from from clouds and from the shadows of clouds. So that's already telling us that there are some complications with this technique. So I'm gonna go through the basics of um, satellites and satellite imagery. I'll tell you how Department of Environmental Conservation and Department of Health use different ways of looking at blooms. Um, we'll look at the different satellites that are available and I'll take you through a, a pilot uh, uh, project to calibrate some of our satellite imagery to chlorophyll. Then you'll be able to uh, see how you can download this imagery for yourself. And then I'll, I'll come to some conclusions. And just off the screen here, this is built on work by NASA, NOAA, uh, the consultants Baird and others. And, and this is a beautiful picture of the Finger Lakes in winter, you can see over here, little Otisco Lake is fully uh, frozen. And then of course the east, sorry, the Western four lakes are also frozen. North of Canandaigua and uh, Cayuga Lakes are also frozen. Right, so let's have a look at the basics of orbits and so on. Obviously we have to launch our satellite um, on a big, powerful rocket. This is actually the Landsat 8 rocket, which is stowed up in the nose cone up here. And you are able to search for and download images from that particular rocket, uh, from that particular satellite. Um, these, are, these satellites are launched into a variety of different orbits. So um, we have low Earth orbit, a medium Earth orbit, and the geocentric orbits. And what these do, a geocentric orbit, means that the uh, satellite is going to be facing the same part of the Earth constantly. It's going around at the same rate that the Earth rotates. The unfortunate thing about those um, geosynchronous uh, orbits is that they are very far out. They're, they're tens of thousands of miles away. And distance does have an effect on a camera, obviously. Uh, if, I, if I'm further away, obviously you can see less of me. If I'm, if I'm close, you can see a lot more. And so what happens is that satellites in a geosynchronous orbit see the same part of the world every day, but from quite a distance. What we're more interested in is these low Earth orbit satellites that we're talking about 300 to 600 miles above the surface, and they're going to rotate around the Earth. 
in this kind of style. So a polar orbit, the Earth is rotating underneath the orbit of the satellite. And so these orbits can be once a day or even um, several times a day. But for our Earth observing satellites, they tend to look at our area of the Earth at about 11 o'clock in the morning, which is a great time because clouds often will bubble up later on in the afternoon. The next time the satellite completes its daily orbit, the Earth will have rotated underneath it, and the area that the satellite scans will be different. And so over a, a period of time, the satellites can see most of the Earth's surface um, over, over time. So we're not, in this case, um, beaming down anything from the satellite. We're not illuminating the surface of the Earth. It's all uh, passive remote sensing. So the Earth is illuminated by the sun, and the emitted light bounces off the surface of the Earth, and the reflected light comes up to the sensors on the satellite. I will talk a little bit later about um, more active remote sensing with lasers. So. Uh, just like our eyes, a satellite can see in the visible part of the spectrum, um, but it's also equipped with sensors that can see um, above and below that visible spectrum. And, and this might remind you of high school science class, which is great. I'm sure you all really enjoyed it. We're also interested in uh, the infrared part of it. <coughs> Sorry, Dottie, Connolly, would you mind um, muting yourself? Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. So um, and we are going to have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So down here, you've got the colors of the spectrum. Um, way, down, uh, way down here, you've got ultraviolet. Up at the top here, you've got infrared. And you can see that there's a spectrum for chlorophyll. So this is showing you that uh, uh, let's see, chlorophyll absorption. R rather, let's look at water. This is just regular old water. It, it um, absorbs in the blue part of the spectrum. And this is, this is kind of screwed up, emission. Just give me a second here. All right. So water emits. This is incorrect, this should be emission. Water emits more light in the blue part of the spectrum and it absorbs light in the green and red parts of the spectrum. And so this is the reason why water looks blue from space. Um, and so chlorophyll should also then absorb in the blue and red parts of the spectrum and emit more in the green part of the spectrum. And that's why plants look green. They, they are reflecting more green light. So the satellites that we are using um, have specific sensors in particular parts of the spectrum. Now you can see along here, we have some sensor um, spectral responses from the Sentinel-3 satellite. And there's very many of them across the visible part of the spectrum, and they are very narrow. They're very specific to different parts of the spectrum. Um, the Sentinel-2 bands, there's fewer of them, and they're also broader in terms of response. So you would think to yourself, well, we're going to use this one because it's much more accurate. Um, but as we'll see, there are reasons why that's not the case. I'm going to review that um, slide to make sure that it's correct later on. All right. So spectral resolution. This is we're talking about how um, accurate the satellite can sense particular parts of the spectrum. And when we put together um, a, a TV picture or a um, or a photograph for our eyes, you can simply take the red and the green and the blue parts of the spectrum and combine those 
three images to get a natural color um, approximation of what you would see if you were a, a, an astronaut orbiting around the planet. But there are other ways of putting um, pictures together. We could take, for instance, not red, but infrared, something that our eyes can't see, but the sensors on the satellite can see and substitute that for the red part of the spectrum. And we're going to get quite a different picture. So spectral resolution is one of the important things that we have to think about when uh, choosing a satellite system. And then here's spatial resolution. And this gets down to uh, Gene's golf balls. Can, can we recover those golf balls from space? Well, uh, starting off with the highest resolution uh, images that the public can get hold of, this is an aerial photograph taken um, from a plane with a special camera system. They're often, often flown in winter when there's less uh, foliage on the trees. And uh, being a scientist, I've put this all in, in the international units, so it's kilometers and, and uh, meters. But just to remind you that one meter is about three feet. So each pixel or each pixel element is about one foot. This is a, an image of Lake Neotawanta, which I've been working on uh, for the last two years on HAB's mitigation technology. And this is actually a blown up um, inset from this point, this is a car. And so you can see that car very clearly. This is the, the hood, a uh, little bit of sun glint, but I'm sorry, Gene, we're still not gonna be able to see your golf balls in, in something like this. So that's very high resolution. The uh, Sentinel-2, satellite system, which has been put into space by the European Space Agency. Each pixel is one, uh, sorry, is 10 meters. And this is sufficient to provide us with actually a, a look at a confirmed harmful algae bloom along the North Shore. And actually there seems to be a little bit on the South Shore as well. We've got a little bit of cloud in the area. So that's, uh, that's a useful, uh, that's definitely a useful resolution. As we get into other satellite systems, the resolution decreases. So I showed you a picture of the Landsat 8 satellite being launched. This is what a Landsat 8 picture of the same scene would look like. We're now down to 30 meter pixels. Uh, we can possibly see that uh, bloom here, but it's, it's starting to get a little bit trickier to interpret. What about um, others? Meris, this is a, one that goes across our region every day, but each pixel is 300 meters. It's really starting to look blurry. And MODIS is even worse at 500 meters per pixel. The great things about those uh, latter two satellite systems though, is that they are able to see um, particular signatures of cyanobacteria. So even though it's a blurry picture, it might be uh, giving us some very useful information. All right, so that, that's an introduction to the, the basics of uh, satellite systems. From a DEC and a Department of Health point of view, what kind of information do we need? Well, so DEC defines a bloom based on concentration. Um, we can take a sample, take it back to the lab and see if the concentration of chlorophyll is sufficient for us to deem it a bloom. We're also able to say just from a photograph, are we pretty certain that it's a cyanobacteria uh, bloom or it might be mil uh, millweed or some other uh, thing that confounds us. We're also interested in how big the bloom is, um, whether it's like this one, which is just next to a dock in Skinny Atlas Lake, or is it a lake-wide bloom like we saw in Owasco Lake in 2017? And we're also interested in the persistence of these uh, blooms. You can see down here, this is from the Skinny Atlas Pier uh, fluoroprobe. We got uh, a confirmed hit from a cyanobacterial bloom, but it was there and gone within an hour. So these things move around very quickly 
both up and down through the water column and um, around a lake, and they can very easily be mixed back in, in some cases. So that's how DEC uh, looks at a bloom. Department of Health, they have similar um, criteria, um, but they're particularly interested because of their jurisdiction in whether harmful algae blooms affect beaches and also water intakes. So let's see if satellites can fulfill any of those particular criteria. And we've got lots of different options. Uh, forgive this busy slide, but uh, we've got the different satellite systems down the side. I've already talked about the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 is going to be uh, launched within a couple of weeks, which is very exciting. It views the Earth's surface every 16 days, which is not great. If you've got a cloudy day in central New York, you've got to wait another 16 days before you can have a chance of another image. Uh, it's got some very useful red, green, blue and infrared bands, 30 meter pixel size. And if you're going to image a lake with just nine pixels, that's quite a lot of lakes in New York. Um, Sentinel-2. Hold on a second. Um, Sentinel-2 is a much greater return period every five days or so. And we can see a lot of lakes in, in New York uh, and so on. So with every satellite system, you have uh, a selection to make. All of these are free. The top four are free. You can get down to one meter pixel size, um, which is just amazing. You can see individual people, um, but these are all going to cost you a great deal of money. And so since price is a very major factor, we have to you know, choose between these. Right, before we do choose though, let's have a look more at some of these constraints. So here's your uh, typical lake. It's more rounded than a lot of the finger lakes with a, an inlet and an outlet. So the pixel size limits the kind of dimensions of a lake which can be viewed from space. Obviously, if our pixel is smaller than the lake, we can see a central pixel like this. It's not got any interference, but as you get more and more pixels, you see the ones on the outside are called mixed pixels, and that's because they have some land and some lake. And so the, the signal that we get back from those pixels are unreliable. They suffer from the mixed pixel problem. And that uh, limits the analysis to the central parts of the lake. So what's the smallest lake that we can see um, with something like the Sentinel uh, satellite system? Well, the smallest lake in the sea slap uh, program, which many of you have heard, that's the Citizens Statewide Lake Assessment Program, is Buckingham Pond near Albany. Uh, it's pretty small, but still there are lots of um, unmixed pixels in the center, which are still usable. So that's pretty good. So for DEC, we've been interested in the percentage of a lake surface which might be covered by a harmful algal bloom. And so if we were going to say, well, one pixel uh, represents 1% of the lake, and we've got some mixed pixels around the edge, we're looking at a, a minimum lake size of about three to four acres. And there are many, many lakes of that size in New York. Uh, Duane Lake, very, very um, median kind of lake in the sea slap program, we can see each pixel is a fraction of a percent. So we would get a very good, accurate description of that lake, all things considered. So with a 250 meter pixel, like some of the ocean sensing satellites like Meris, Modis, um, there are not very many lakes that are properly resolved in New York State. 
if we use uh, 10 meter pixels, with each pixel representing at least 1% of the lake, well, we can start to see thousands and thousands of water bodies lakes and rivers in New York State. So you can see that this is potentially a powerful uh, technique. But there are very many limitations and interferences that we have to take into account. So for uh, shallow lakes, we can see the bottom of those lakes. And for deeper lakes, with very clear water, we can see many parts of those lakes and I shall show you some images later on. Um, we can also see macrophytes or, or weeds and so they make the water greener, or they change the color of the water, so we have to make sure that we are sure of what we're looking at is not weeds, rather they're green algae or cyanobacteria. Um, in parts of the state we have naturally brown water with organic acids, humic acid, for instance, tannic acid, and those tend to make the water browner, and that's an added complication. Uh, we can have sediment plumes coming into the lakes. We have certainly, we know that we have clouds. Those are relatively easy to spot, but cloud shadows are quite difficult because the surface of our lakes are already quite dark. And we can have waves, um, glint, sun glint from the reflection of the sun, water vapor, as I'll show you, aerosols, dust and cirrus. And then we've also got the different um, mixtures of algae through the season. Um, so as summer progresses, we tend to go from diatoms to green algae and then to cyanobacteria. And each one of those has a separate color spectrum that we have to take into account. I was talking about the atmosphere. Um, obviously on the moon, it's a terrible place for a party because there's just no atmosphere. Sorry, boom, boom. Um, but down in the Finger Lakes, we certainly have moisture um, vapor, and that turns what are actually green trees off into the distance, they turn blue. So we have to take that signal out in order for our images to be comparable. And that's done with uh, special filters. Here's some examples of interferences from the Finger Lakes. Um, Awasco, the water is clear enough that you can see the sand um, up on the north shore. Cayuga Lake, these are beds of macrophytes and, and shallow areas. For Awasco, uh, we captured a, a very nice, or a very clearly delineated sediment plume and a second plume, which is a slightly different color here. Uh, Otisco Lake has a secondary basin which catches a lot of sediment. You can see that very clearly. And down here you can see even contrails from an aeroplane. We've even caught the aeroplane in flight. And the red, green and blue images are actually taken one second apart by this satellite. So we could measure the speed of that aeroplane if we really wanted to. So the uh, the lake bottom is sometimes more visible than others. So in, in September or, or in summer, there's more, there often tends to be more algae in the water. You can see less of the lake bottom in September than you can when water is very, very clear at the end of a, a relatively gentle winter with not a great deal of spring runoff you're looking at um, very deep parts of the lake here. In fact, this is where I'm going to talk a little bit more about active remote sensing um, using a satellite called ICESat. And this was launched a couple of years ago specifically to measure the height of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. But um, very quickly, people realized that the laser beams that were shot out from this satellite and sensed with a telescope on board were able to also measure the height of lakes, which we can see right here. This is Skinny Atlas Lake. These are the traces of the various laser beams that are shot out by this satellite. 
But because of the very clear water, the laser beams go all the way down to the bottom of the lake. And this is actually 18.6 meters in depth. And so the laser beam is able to go through space, the atmosphere, water bounces off the bottom of the lake, through the water, through the atmosphere, and back up to the satellite, which is all just absolutely incredible. I love working with this data because it's freaking laser beams. Um, and so I think that there's not much cooler than space lasers. Right. After having said all of that, the um, satellite system that I've chosen to work with, and we have a, a master's degree student at ESF working on this, is the Sentinel-2 system of satellites. There are two of them, um, imaginatively called A and B, and they're multispectral, so they're able to see uh, across the visible infrared and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. Um, they have 10 meter pixels, which is a good compromise. They come over every five days. They're free to use. And critically for us, they have a long-term replacement strategy uh, of two more satellites in the future, also imaginatively termed C and D. And just a word here, since this is a European system, it always seems to be cloudy over Great Britain. Here's France. All right, so how do, we, uh, how do we actually use this data in a quantitative way rather than just producing pretty pictures? So how can we take something like this raw satellite image? Um, this is a natural color mixture of red, green, and blue. The Eastern Finger Lakes going from Atisco all the way to Canandaigua. How can we take that and turn it into something that DEC can use, for instance? So, what we do is we put together uh, samples of water that have been analyzed for chlorophyll. We put those together. So here's the in situ ob observations on the left. Uh, where are we? In situ observations of water quality parameters during a satellite overpass. And we also get the image that results on that day. We put them together. We do an atmospheric correction because of that water vapor. And we can then develop uh, an empirical relationship. So a straight line, hopefully, between chlorophyll concentration and basically how green is that lake, to put it in the simplest terms. Once we've got that straight line, we can come up with some model coefficients. And then we can apply those model coefficients to new satellite images to come up with an estimate of the chlorophyll. So what does that look like in practice? Well, it's kind of a complicated process uh, for, for many reasons. One is that his uh, Canandaigua Lake, we can't use a lot of these points because what we're seeing there is, is um, partly the lake bottom. We can only use uh, some of the deeper points. You can also see that and this is honey oil, you can see that the distribution of harmful algae blooms is very patchy and it's likely to be ephemeral. So we have to try and get a sample as the satellite passes over within a couple of hours. Otherwise, we're not really comparing apples with apples. Um, and that is phenomenally difficult to do. However, we've tried our best. And with an early part of the data set, just from 17, 2017 and 18, these were all of the Finger Lakes. You can see uh, here we've got chlorophyll concentrations increasing. And this is basically a measure of how green the satellite image is. Now, uh, statisticians amongst you will really question this r squared value. Uh, it, it seems to be anchored by a couple of these points up here. Um, these are Honey Oil Lake uh, with very high chlorophyll levels. Canisius Lake was uh, a couple of these points, and some of the other lakes are, are down here. Um, later data has improved that number of uh, samples. Uh, 
many more than just 29 samples. And so uh, we're still working on it, absolutely. So uh, not to uh, go into the detail of this, but we put all of this data into uh, an algorithm in a program called ArcGIS and come up at the end of the day with a chlorophyll A concentration estimate for each pixel in that satellite data. And uh, as I showed before, uh, you can see Canandaigua. This is the limit of interpretation. Everything to the north of that, we have not a great deal of confidence in. Um, but because of the high resolution, you can see the patchiness in the data. Um, whereas if we were using a, a much lower uh, spatial resolution, we wouldn't be able to get that um, so clearly. And here's uh, Skinny Atlas Lake. This is also the limit of interpretation because of the shallowness and usual clarity. And what that is showing is, it's very small on my screen, but basically Skinny Atlas has got very, very little chlorophyll in it um, most of the time. So we're trying to extend this to the whole of the CSLAP uh, data set of 170 or so New York State lakes, um, particularly mesotrophic and oligotrophic lakes. We're also uh, able to access the Adirondack Lake data set that's coming um, later on this month. And eventually we're hoping that we'd be able to extend this technique to all suitable New York state lakes to come up with a, an estimate of chlorophyll concentration through time. You can imagine that that's going to be an awful lot of work and a great deal of computer power is going to be required to do that. So now how to see your lake? Uh, I'm sure uh, you've all been excited to hear uh, what you might be able to do. I, I just want to go through how you could do this kind of thing, or at least see uh, pictures of your lake from space. And um, I'm going to give you a live demonstration, which is almost certain to go wrong. But the two things that you need uh, to do this are a source of satellite data. Uh, this first one is the European Space Agency's data repository. Uh, with all of these, you need to log in or create a login before you can download stuff. Uh, the second one is from NASA. So that concentrates on NASA satellites. Um, and the one that I'm going to be using tonight is Earth Explorer. And that's a great website because it gives you a selection of NASA, USGS, uh, European Space Agency, and you name it. E there's even declassified satellite pictures from uh, the 1960s in there. So uh, as, as I go through this, and it won't take me very long, but the method is basically simple. You have to select your source, um, and we're going to use Earth Explorer. We're going to select the area that we're interested in, and in this case, I'm going to look for Canisius Lake. We have to select the dates that we are interested in finding imagery for. We have to select the satellite that has taken the pictures. And then once we're able to see a list or some pictures, we can then view them and then potentially download them. So let's see if this is going to work. All right, so we're in to Earth Explorer. Um, now, I am already logged in. Um, uh, if you're interested in doing this, I would definitely suggest you, you go through the, the login process um, and it's very easy to do. All right, so it starts off for some reason in, where is that, Iowa or, or um, Minnesota? We're not so interested. I'm using my mouse to move us over to New York. And I'm going to mouse in to, here we go. Here is beautiful Canisius Lake. All right. So there's a series of ways that you can zoom in or, or find Canisius Lake. You can either um, 
type in the feature, feature name, Venetius Lake, and show that. And it's already in the database. It's got a little marker here. And we can then um, use this whole map, or we can zoom in a little bit more. And it's going to put four corners at the edge of that original view. And I can move those corners down to just Canisius Lake. All right, beautiful. Um, so that's, that's our area. Now we're interested in, say, looking at green algae or cyanobacteria. And in this case, I'm going to go for all images from the beginning of August. And if I don't put anything into the date here, it'll just come up to the present day. Um, I have decided that I'm going to go for anything, any of the images, including those that have got assessed cloud cover. And you'll see why in a second. Right, let's have a look at the data sets. These are the satellites that we can use. These are the sources of imagery. And you can see that there's uh, aerial imagery, which is the very high resolution stuff. Uh, this declassified spy data from the CIA uh, original satellites. Um, but the, the two that you might be most interested in are Landsat, which uh, is a great, uh, a great um, archive of satellite data going back 50 years. And uh, the and of course, that is one of its best assets. You can see land use changes going back over that period of time. It is somewhat a complex structure to the Landsat archive. And so for, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to go for Sentinel satellites. I'm going to click on that. Brings up some uh, blurb about um, this website doesn't actually generate the data, but and there's also a little bit of a time delay between the satellite taking the picture and it appearing on this website, but that's fine. So we have got enough to come up with the results. So let's have a look. Now, here are the results. I've actually got 12 different images and you can see that there are little thumbnails of the image. Now, some of these have got black patches in them this is basically the edge of the swath of the satellite's um, image. And so we just have to uh, take that into account. If I click on this, it will bring up a, a bigger thumbnail. And you can see, unfortunately, there's plenty of cloud here. Um, so it's not really a usable image. So let's go through these and find something that might be a little bit more usable. This is from the 26th of August. I'm sure you remember that that was a beautiful uh, morning uh, in Canisius. And we can even click on that and zoom in a little bit more. We've got Canisius and Canadice and Hemlock and so on. So even at this stage, you've already got an image of your lake from space. And, and that, for some of you, will be enough. But you can download an even higher resolution than that once you have been signed in. Um, and the way to do that is you've got various icons associated with this particular image. What I want to do is download some of these images. You're given, in this case, two different options. A full resolution browse in GeoTIFF, which is five megabytes, that's going to be a, a nice detailed picture. It is in JPEG format. Um, this one is going to be if you're interested in doing some GIS on your satellite image. But let's have a look at what kind of resolution you can achieve with um, just this relatively low resolution. All right. So we can zoom in. Let's make sure that we're zooming into Canisius. And we can get relatively close in before it gets blurry. Uh, you can see individual fields. You can see roads. You can see the outlet there. Once you get too close in, 
um, the JPEG compression algorithm starts to blur the edges of the uh, lake, unfortunately. But for an overview, that is pretty powerful. Uh, OK, uh, so let me get back to my presentation. Uh, OK, so that, that's the little um, demonstration. So my conclusions then, and I'm, I'm about on time. So uh, using satellite data for algae bloom, well, there are some definite benefits, but there are also some constraints. We can definitely use uh, this satellite data to estimate. I think that that's not quite right, to estimate surface chlorophyll A. Um, and we can look at water bodies that are relatively small in size. We can get some data that is as frequent as a day uh, or two, and that might be good enough for an overall water body assessment, a recreational assessment. But we think that it's not um, high spatial resolution enough for a notification program for the public, especially because some of the satellite data is delayed by hours and days between the image being taken and it being available uh, to you know, researchers or, or officials. Um, we don't think it's useful for assessing potable water uh, intakes because many of those intakes are at depth. And so we're not really measuring chlorophyll concentrations deep into the lake. And we also think that it's not really useful for um, evaluation of bathing beaches because of that mixed pixel problem that I, I talked about. And um, the lake bottom visibility for small beach areas near shore is, is not great. So uh, I'd just like to thank, uh, thank some of the uh, organizations that have provided data for this presentation. I don't know if you can see James Tompkins is drawing all over my screen, um, but European Space Agency, NASA, USGS, and so on. Um, here's some references if you want to take it further. I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, this is my crew of Amy and Tony out on, uh, I think that this was Canandaigua um, in the winter time. All right, thanks very much. Lewis, thank you so much. I, if anyone has a question, you can hold your space bar down and ask those your question. We have nothing in the chat, Lewis. Wonderful. I must have covered everything. Um, we can give it so uh gene sorry the the final answer you're you're muted gene the final answer is definitely we won't be able to see your uh okay golf ball from space might be able to spot your car though okay uh question um it's most likely that some of the highly accurate satellites that are used for security purposes and so on have a much higher resolution is there any indication that someday when those that information becomes available, it could have a significant impact on what you've talked about tonight? So those um, very highly detailed um, satellites can get down to ridiculous resolutions of inches, but quite often they are what's called panchromatic. So they're black and white and grayscale. And we're interested in phenomena that are green. So really you could launch, you could design a, a satellite specifically for sensing uh, algae blooms, but there hasn't been one launched as yet. So, I mean, to answer your question, I think the SPY satellite data, once it's declassified, not going to be particularly useful to us, unfortunately. Those, 
Uh, Carl asks, can you speak about getting different co color combinations from the images? Yes. So I, I did uh, concentrate mostly on this red, green, blue uh, combination, which gives you uh, what's called a natural color image. But if you're willing to go into a, a slightly difficult wormhole, you can substitute a variety of different spectral um, bands for the red, green and blue in your display. And I find those somewhat more difficult to interpret. Um, but yes, it's quite possible to do that from a display point of view. I didn't get into all of the different algorithms that use different spectral bands and band ratios to come up with the best uh, estimate for chlorophyll, even for phycocyanin. Um, and there's a whole uh, discipline that is looking at those and they're coming up with new algorithms every day. In fact, uh, let me uh, just show you. These uh, references um, talk about the maximum chlorophyll index. These aren't just red, green and blue uh, parts of the spectrum. They're going to mix and match various uh, spectral signatures to get the best, um, to get the best estimate for chlorophyll. Yeah, I think that answers uh, Sid's question using chlorophyll data. Can you distinguish between their various types of blooms? It does, uh, thank you. Thanks for that question, uh, Sid, and, and also Carl. Um, so if you go back to that uh, graph that I showed that I kind of stumbled over, um, we have got very highly detailed spatial resolution using Sentinel-2, but what we don't have is very detailed spectral resolution. And because we're only seeing kind of generally green, generally red, generally blue, the spectral signatures of cyanobacteria and green algae are insufficiently resolved to be able to tell the difference between green algae and cyanobacteria um, using Sentinel-2. That's my feeling. Perhaps our um, ESF uh, master's PhD student will come up with something fantastic, but that, that's my feeling at the moment. Those Two more questions uh, from um, Ray Case. What applications for this technology are lakes in New York using? Uh, well, the, the technology is still in its infancy. Um, so it's not really used by a lot of lakes at the moment. Um, they could use it, though, for uh, tracking historical blooms. Um, they could use it generally to find out whether their lake is uh, highly enriched in chlorophyll or not. Um, and, and we're definitely going to be interested to see if we can use it for lake classification across the whole of the state. I hope that answers your question. And one from Elena, do you have a favorite data set like that you find interesting? Yes, well, um, of course, Canisius is my favorite, I have to say that. Um, but another very interesting lake is um, Canandaigua, not very far from, from Canisius. And I find that interesting because it is exceptionally clear at some times of the year. And then it also seems to have some significant blooms. And uh, so that contrast is, is great. Um, honey oil, for instance, that is unfortunately a reliable bloomer, it seems in the last couple of years. And those data points are really valuable for us to get the high level uh, concentration. So 
yeah, some of the eutrophic finger lakes are, are very useful, um, but we wish they weren't eutrophic, of course. Thanks for your question. And a question from Eric Randall. Can you distinguish between chlorophyll A, B, and E? No, uh, uh, definitely not. Uh, and it's for the same reason that I mentioned before, the spectral resolution using Sentinel-2 is just not high enough to distinguish between the spectral signatures of those uh, A, B, C, and D. Uh, so we can barely distinguish uh, between chlorophyll and uh, phycocyanin. We, I think we, we're going to try and do that, but I think we'll struggle. But thanks for your question, Eric. Okay, I do not see any more questions. Oh, uh, can you use land-based crops to calibrate the spectral signature? Um, you know, uh, quite a lot of work has been, well, uh, an enormous amount of work has been done using satellites to look at crop yields and crop health. So um, one of the Landsat series of satellites main uses is agricultural crop um, estimation. Um, actually, you know what, I've, I've been out in the field the last couple of days and weeks and I've noticed that some fields of corn look really healthy and green and others have started to show some uh, wilt on the top and down in the bottom. And so even if you say, well, it's a field of corn, that can be somewhat variable. So um, it's a great question. Um, I'd have to think a bit, a little bit more about that. But thank you. Okay, uh, you'll stop sharing your screen, yep. Lewis. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending tonight. I would also like to uh, recognize I can find it. Recognize uh, Dr. Lewis McCaffrey in a certificate of appreciation. Uh, Lewis, I'll email this to you. You can print it and put it on your wall in your office or burn it. But <laughs> We greatly appreciate your time and effort and your ongoing support to our education series. Uh, much really appreciate it. I think every year for the last four, uh, you have presented at least one, if not two, uh, topics. And they're always very interesting. So thank you. Uh, I'll zoom round the pause for you. And thank you, Charlie. As a reminder, um, our next presentation is October 27th. So about mid-October, we'll have a fire out. If you want to see our programs, you can go to our kinesislake.org, uh, scan this QR code, or go to our website and see this uh, poster on our website. Um, one more thing, uh, at the end of the tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, each participant will get a survey. It's a seven minute survey. Uh, we really would like your feedback on the program, the presenter, 
and more importantly, what topics in the future would you like to hear about? Uh, the committee is putting our 2022 um, schedule together right now. So if you have a burning desire on any topics in our watershed, uh, provide that feedback and we'll fold them into our schedule. With that, I'll close the meeting. Thank you again, Lewis. And uh, thank you all that have participated. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone.